second order systems. After watching this movie, the viewer should be able to tell the order of a circuit just from looking at it. For a second order circuit, determine its eigenvalues. From the eigenvalues, say if the circuit is overdamped, critically damped, or underdamped. From the very same eigenvalues, write the general form of the response as a function of time. At the center of this conversation are inductors and capacitors. Inductors and capacitors, they are more alike than they are different. Why do I say that? Because both of them, they store energy. Remember, inductors according to this formula and capacitors according to this other one. That's why we call them both energy storage elements or ESE for short. We have seen that ESCs, energy storage elements, they have memory. Inductors, they have memory of their currents. Capacitors, they have memory of their voltages. The number of memories in the system is what defines its order. System? You mean circuit, right? No, I mean system. Check this out. In the mechanical device, Inertia is akin to inductance and its parameter is mass, that is mechanical inductance. Spring action, that is elasticity, is akin to capacitance. So, mass and spring action, they are also energy storage elements. Again, the number of ESCs is what defines the order of a system, be it electrical or mechanical, it doesn't matter. A note, friction in mechanical system is akin to resistance in electric circuits. Akin to? How is that? In a capacitor, the voltage is proportional to the charge in the capacitor, Q, right? In a spring, the force you apply is proportional to how far you extend the spring, one end of it, from the other. In a resistor, the voltage you apply to it is proportional to how quickly the charge flows through it. In a damper, the force you apply is proportional to how quickly you move one end of the damper away from the other, or closer to the other. In an inductor, the voltage you apply is proportional to how quickly you change the current through it. In the mass system, the force you apply is proportional to how quickly you change the velocity with which it is moving. So you see, if we make the analogy of voltage on one side to forces in the mechanical system and of charges in electric systems to displacements in mechanical ones, we have a perfect bridge between electric systems and mechanical systems and that's why we say that the hook constant K is actually the inverse of the capacitance in the mechanical system. That a damper's D coefficient is the resistance of a mechanical system and that Newton's mass in the mechanical system is the inductance in those systems. Let's have a, an example. A mechanical system that we are all very familiar with, the damping system of a car. In it, we see immediately the inductance, the mass of the car. That system has the capacitance in the springs that we can see under the fenders. And the damping is the resistance of the mechanical system provided for the dampers that you can also see behind the wheels of your car. Any is ordering, say that again. If a system has an energy storage elements, it is described by differential equation of order n, and it is said to be an order n system, a differential equation like this one. You see, order n. Y is a function of time in an electric circuit. It could be a voltage, could be a current. In a mechanical system, that could be a displacement. Let's see if all of these checks for circuits that we are familiar with, RL circuits and RC circuits. We'll remember that RL circuits and RC circuits have only one energy storage element. 
a capacitor in an RC circuit and an inductor in an RL circuit. They are both described by first order differential equation, like this one for the RL circuit and this one for an RC circuit. They are indeed first order circuits. In this part of our course, our main interest is in second order circuits, that is, circuits that have perhaps two inductors that cannot be simplified in series or in parallel, or maybe circuits that have two capacitors that cannot be simplified, or even circuits that have one inductor and one capacitor. The comment, simplifiable, is a word that appears in the Collins English Dictionary, but not in the Oxford one. Your choice. This circuit with a switch closed is a second order circuit because it has two ESCs, the capacitor on the left, C1, and the capacitor on the right, C2. Its description is given by a second order ordinary differential equation, like this one, coefficients A2, A1, and A0, right hand side K. Description. What do you mean by its description? Well, what I mean is, any voltage or any current in that circuit is given as the solution of an ordinary differential equation of order 2, like this one. Think of Y as the voltage in this capacitor, or the current in this resistor, or the current over here, or the voltage over here. So any parameter in that circuit, if you want to solve it, you will end with a second order differential equation that you need to solve. So it's important then to remember how it is that we solve this second order differential equation. To solve for y of t from this second order differential equation, what we need is two the initial conditions. We need the initial value of y of t at 0 plus, and we also need the initial value of dy dt at 0 plus. Before we go any further into the future, let's look into the past. In our high school training, solving a quadratic equation, one like this one, ax squared plus bx plus c equals zero. We remember an equation like that had two roots, right? The roots could be either real or perhaps complex numbers. The roots were given by this simple formula. The two roots were obtained using the plus or the minus in the formula. In that formula, we identified b squared minus 4ac as an important parameter. We call that the discriminant of the quadratic equation. If that discriminant happened to be a positive number, then the roots were real and different ones, two different real roots. But if the discriminant was zero, in that case, of course, the two roots become only one negative b divided by 2a. We have only one root that we pretentiously call that a double root, just to comply with the assertion that every second degree polynomial equation has two roots. Geez, it's only one root. And if the discriminant is a negative number, in that case things get really interesting because the two roots become two complex conjugate numbers with a real part sigma and an imaginary part omega. The solution of a differential equation like this one, a second order differential equation with constant coefficients a2, a1, a0, and the right hand side which is a constant k, could be either something like that, or like this, or even like that. You say, no, wait, wait, wait a second. Can you go back again and more slowly? Oh, sure. The solution of a second order ordinary differential equation could have this shape. It could be the sum of two exponentials, the first one with an amplitude k1 and a time constant negative 1 over b1, and another exponential of amplitude k2 and a time constant negative 1 over b2. Or could have this form. Could be a ramp with a slope k1 multiplied by an exponential of a time constant negative 1 over b. Or could even be like this one. This is more fun. It is an oscillation, a sinusoidal with a frequency omega whose amplitude is not constant. That amplitude 
2 it keeps getting smaller and smaller and smaller given the time constant negative 1 over sigma. If the solution is of the first type, we say that the system, the circuit, or the differential equation is overdamped. If the solution is a ramp times an exponential, we say the circuit is critically damped. If the solution is a decaying sinusoid like this, an oscillation that keeps getting smaller and smaller until it dies off, the system is underdamped. We better have a look at them graphically so that they stick to our memory. Here we have an example of an overdamped response. The first one, an exponential with an amplitude 5 and a time constant one third of a second. The second one, an exponential with an amplitude 2 and a time constant half a second. In the end, after those two exponentials decay, the final value of y of t will be 1.2. Here is the shape of that function of time. In the end, the curve becomes horizontal at 1.2. Another one. In this case, we have an oscillation of 350 radians per second multiplied by an amplitude that begins at 5 and keeps getting smaller and smaller with a time constant of 1 20th of a second. This one. Check this out. Indeed, if the time constant is 1 20th of a second, 5 times that will be 1 4th of a second, 0.25. That means that if we wait 0.25 seconds, all of this oscillation will disappear 0.2, 0 0.25 about here, and all we're left with is 1.2, the final value of that oscillation. And last, the critically damped response. This one, a ramp with a slope 5 times 12, multiplied by an exponential that has a time constant of half a second. It looks like that at first because the exponential near zero is very close to one, the ramp is winning, ramping up. But soon enough, the small value of the exponential wins and pulls down the ramp to its final value 1.2. The question is, how do we know which one of those forms is the one for our differential equation, for our circuit, for our system? How? Solve the characteristic equation. The what? Let's say that this is a differential equation we need to solve. Coefficients 2, 7, 3, right hand side 5. We write a quadratic equation with the same coefficients. This one. That is what we call the characteristic equation. Hey, what's with a b? Why don't we write x? It is tradition to write a characteristic equation using b instead of x for an unknown. When we solve that, we get the two roots of the characteristic equation, in this case negative one half for b1 and b2 is negative three. By the way, the roots of the characteristic equations are called the eigenvalues of the equation, eigenvalues of the system, eigenvalues of the circuit. In English, because that is more German than English, that means the self-values. Those are the two numbers that identify, that describe the true nature of that circuit, how it will respond in front of external excitations. So again, why is it that we're solving the characteristic equation? Because the two roads will tell us which one of the three forms will be the solution of the ordinary differential equation, right? Should we call them eigenvalues? Yes, because the eigenvalues tell us which one of the three forms will be the solution of our ordinary differential equation. If the eigenvalues are two real ones, b1 and b2, the solution looks like this, where b1 and b2, the two eigenvalues, appear as exponents in the two exponentials. If the eigenvalue is a single one, a double real b, in that case, the solution has that eigenvalue here as part of the exponent of the only solitary exponential. And the system is critically damped, and the first one was overdamped. But if the eigenvalues turn out to be complex conjugate numbers, sigma plus or minus j omega, in that case the response is a decaying sinusoid with a frequency omega, the imaginary part of the eigenvalue, 
and uh, an exponential with sigma, the real part, in its numerator with a time constant of negative 1 over sigma in seconds. Interesting, eh? Again, let's use proper names. If the roots of the characteristic equation, that is the eigenvalues, are two real ones, the system is overdamped. We know that. Two exponential sprouts plus k3. If the eigenvalue is only one double, the system is critically damped. And we have one ramp multiplied by the single exponential. If the two eigenvalues are complex conjugate ones, the system is underdamped, and we have a d gain sinusoid. Let's remember that instead of saying the roots of the characteristic equation, we will say from now on the eigenvalues. It's shorter and it's more descriptive. And what about the case? You see, in each one of the three solutions, they are k1, k2, and k3. How do we find them? Well, let's begin by saying something. Do you agree with me that if we wait long enough, the exponentials in each one of those expressions will decay smaller than any imaginable number? And we will be left with only k3. So the value of y of t at infinity is only k3. k3 is the steady state value of the function, of the solution to the differential equation. How are we going to find k1, k2, and k3 again? By the way, they are just integration constants. Let's begin with k3. How do we find k3? Well, k3 is the steady state value of the function y, right? But in dc, in dc, in steady state, this derivative is 0, and this derivative is 0. So we are left simply with one equation. That is, at infinity, the first two terms are 0, and we have a not y of infinity is the uppercase k. But y at infinity is just k3, right? From there we solve for k3. k3, the steady state value of y of t, is this uppercase k divided by the coefficient a naught. What about the other two k's? k1 and k2, they depend on the initial conditions. y at 0 plus and dy dt at 0 plus. Let's say we know the form of y of t. Could be over, under, or critically damped, but we know what it is. Then we can write a system of two equations with the two unknowns k1 and k2 and solve for them. How? What two equations? Well, one equation for y of t and t equals 0, and the other for dy dt at t equals 0. In those equations, we shall see we have only two unknowns, k1 and k2. Let's see an example. I will solve in detail the overdamped case. In an overdamped circuit, the form of the solution looks like that. Two exponentials plus k3. k3 we already know. We can differentiate that and find that dy dt at any point in time is given by this expression. But if we evaluate them both at t equals 0, the exponentials will become 1 and we will have at t equals 0 something much simpler. This one, see? The exponentials are 1. k3 is known. So, because we also know those two initial conditions, we have a system of two equations and two unknowns, k1 and k2. Remember, k3 is already known. It is big K divided by a naught. I leave to you, my student, the task of doing the same for the underdamped case and for the critically damped case. In the underdamped case, however, I warn you, you're going to end with two equations in the two unknowns k1 and k2, but the equations will be non-linear, including some trigonometric functions. So you cannot use just the HP50G. You will have your mathematical acumen to solve for k1 and k2. Let's review for a moment how do we find the initial conditions, something we saw in a previous course. We have seen in the previous course how to find the initial value of the voltage in the capacitor, right? And also the initial value for the current in an inductor. And uh, indeed, even how to find the initial value of the derivative of each one of them. How was that? 
Well, let's review part of that for DC sources. In general, to determine K1 and K2, we will need Y and 0 plus and dy dt and signal plus. If we are dealing with the voltage of a capacitor, Y of t, then we're going to need the voltage in the capacitor at 0 plus, which is the same at 0 minus, we remember that, and dvc dt at 0 plus 2. Remember, dvc dt at 0 plus is not the same as dvc dt at 0 minus, so we need to solve for the current in the capacitor at 0 plus after we move the switches. And at 0 plus, the general equation IC C dvc dt holds. At 0 plus, we solve for this derivative and we say dvc dt at 0 plus is just the value of the current in the capacitor that we compute divided by C. How we find this? We find IC, the current in the capacitor at 0 plus, divided by C, and there is dvc dt at 0 plus. And for the inductor, if y of t is the current in an inductor, in that case we need to find IL at 0 plus, and dil dt at 0 plus as well. How? Well, we use the general formula. Voltage in the inductor is LDI dt at any point in time. We evaluate that at 0 plus and solve for di. L D T and zero plus. Find the voltage in the inductor at zero plus at that instant. Divide that by L, and that is the value we need. Hmm. Remember the first value I L naught. We find from a snapshot at zero minus. Why? Well, because a uh, that current will not change from zero minus to zero plus. Right? It is the same as V C naught for the capacitor. It doesn't change from. 0 minus to 0 plus. That's why we find them at 0 minus where it's easier. And then we take a snapshot at 0 plus and find from there dil dt at 0 plus. That's how. Let's have a look at a numerical example. Tutorial time. In this circuit, the switch has been closed for a very long time. So the circuit is in steady state. The sources are DC, so it's in DC steady state. At t equals 0, the switch opens, and we want to find what is the current in the inductor flowing downwards as a function of time. Let's begin by finding the initial conditions. We take a snapshot of the circuit right before the switch opens, at t equals 0 minus. Why? Because at that point in time, the circuit is in DC steady state. And it's very easy to find IL0 and VC0 there. Snapshot at t equals 0. The inductor will behave as a short circuit, DC steady state, and the capacitor behaves as an open circuit because it's DC steady state like that. Switch closed. This wire is the representation of the inductor, and this open circuit represents the capacitor. The current through the wire is IL0. The voltage here is VC0. Because there is no current on the right-hand side, the current IL0 is simply 12 divided by 4 in series with 4, right? That is 1.5 amps. And the voltage VC0, what is it? Well, the current in this 4 ohm resistor is 0, so its voltage is 0 as well. That means that VC0 is the voltage in this 4 ohm resistor here. But that voltage there can be computed either as 1.5 amps multiplied by 4, that is 6 volts. Or you could say, hey, check this out. There is no current on this branch, so we have a voltage divider, 12 divided between 4 and 4, that is 6 volts anyway, right? So that's how we found VC0. Now we are to find DIL DT at 0 plus, but for that we need to take a snapshot of the circuit at 0 plus. At 0 plus, the inductor behaves as a current source for a snapshot for a microsecond with the value IL0. And the capacitor behaves as a stubborn voltage source with the value VC0. This is a snapshot of the circuit at 0 plus. The switch is open, so the left hand side of the circuit is irrelevant. The inductor behaves as a current source with the value 1.5 amps flowing downwards and the capacitor behaves as a voltage source of 6 volts with that polarity. 
we need to find what is the current in the capacitor. The current in the capacitor is defined positive downwards, right? And the voltage in the inductor. The voltage in the inductor is defined positive, plus at the top, minus at the bottom. That is because of the convention of signs we used to find the initial conditions at first, in the first circuit. So, the current source here is pushing the current through a capacitor upward, so the current in the capacitor is negative 1.5 amps. That is the current in the capacitor at zero plus. If we need a DVC DT at zero plus, we just divide that current negative 1.5 by the capacitance 0 0.1 and we get negative 15 volts per second. That is how quickly the voltage in the capacitor is changing with time right after we move the switch. What about VL0? To find VL0, I will use a KVL equation in this loop. That one. How is that? Well, I know the voltage in the source is 6 volts. I know the current in the two resistors, 1.5 amps, so I can compute the voltage in each of the resistors with the right polarity and write a KVL equation. I will write that following this loop clockwise. Clockwise. You say, don't you follow the current? The current is going counterclockwise. No, I don't. I can write my KVL equation using any direction I want, and I want clockwise today. So, going on by VL0, VL0 is positive. Going on by 4 times 1.5, going on by 4 times 1.5, going down by 6 equals 0. That is my KVL equation we saw for VL0, negative 6 volts. If we divide that negative 6 volts by the inductance, like so, we get DIL DT and signal plus negative 3 amps per second. So the current in the inductor, right after we close the switch, is 1.5 amps, but it's decaying with a rate of negative 3 amps per second. Now for the time response. Let's find the current in the inductor after the switch opens as a function of time. The first thing is draw the circuit for T after 0 and use P impedances for inductors and capacitors, right? Here you go. The left-hand side of the circuit has been erased because it's not part of the circuit anymore. And the inductor is represented as LP, 2 Henry's P, this is 2P, and the capacitor as 1 over CP, 1 over 0.1P, that is 10 over P. Because there are no sources in this circuit, I will add a fake current source anywhere in parallel with the branch with the value F fake. That is zero, but we will make it zero after we have our differential equation. So let's write that. We write a KCL equation for the one node at the top, and that is currents going in F on the right hand side, and currents leaving would be V1 divided by 4 plus 2P, this one on the left through the inductor, and V1 divided by 4 plus 10 over P. That is a current through the capacitor. We solve for V1, but for that I'm going to use the calculator. Check it out. The first thing is I make sure the independent variable up here is V1, and then symbolic solver and solve for X, this one, and we get that V1 is that. That is no solution. That is just the differential equation that we need to solve to find V1. But V1, let me copy it down here, is not what I'm looking for. What I'm looking for is the current in the inductor. It is this term, V1 divided by 4 plus 2P. So we just have to divide this expression by 2P in the calculator. We write 4 plus 2P, divide and simplify with the eval key. That expression on the right, that is the current in the inductor as a differential equation. So that is no solution. That is not really the solution. That is just the differential equation that we need to solve to find IL. Now it's the time to make F0. That is 0. And this is the differential equation whose solution is the current in the inductor. Coefficients 1, 4, and 5. The initial conditions for that current are negative 1.5 and DIL DT and 0 plus is negative 15 amps per sec. Now, find the eigenvalues. Write the characteristic equation, b squared plus 4b plus 5 equals 0, and the eigenvalues turn out to be two complex conjugate numbers, negative 2 plus and minus j. 
we know we're going to get an underdamped response for that current. The current will be oscillating with a frequency 1 radian per second. And with the time constant, the amplitude will decay, the amplitude of the oscillation, with a time constant of half a second. So the underdamped solution for that current after t equals 0 has this form. k1, an exponential negative 2t. You see this negative 2 is sigma. Sine of 1 times t, that is omega 1, plus k2, plus k3. We know that k3 we can find from 5 and 0. That is going to be 0, 0 over 5. The derivative of that, we find that immediately, right? That is very easy to find. And then we evaluate them both at t equals 0 plus, And we get this for the current. And we get this for the derivative, right? Observe k3 is it over 5, it's 0. So we cancel out that k3 from this specific case. Now let's solve that. Remember that we know who is IL at 0 plus and DIL, DT at 0 plus, right? Yeah. Those two values are known. Those are 1.5 and negative 15. A system of two nonlinear equations, rather. How do we find that? Well, from the first one, we can say that sine of K2 is 1.5 divided by K1, right? Yeah, that's right. And we can substitute it down here and get that the first term is a negative 2 times uh, 1.5. That is negative 3, all of these terms. That is super. But what about cosine k2? Who is cosine k2? You and I remember from high school that sine squared plus cosine squared is 1. So we can solve for cosine x as the square root of 1 minus sine squared. So we know sine. We can compute the cosine of k2 as the square root of 1 minus this sine squared. We substitute those two functions in the second equation, and we get what is a quadratic equation in this case. I invite you to do all the manipulations and write that as a proper quadratic equation, and then when you solve for k1, you get this term at the, at the top, negative 12.0934. And then with that value there, you substitute it up here and find k2 is negative 0 0.1244 radians. Now we can write that the current in the inductor is negative 12.09 e to the negative 2t sine of t minus 0 0.12 radians. And all of that amperes. That is your solution. Here's another way of solving that, perhaps simpler, right? We arrive at the same two equations, but what I'm going to do is substitute the first one into the second one. k1 sine k2 is 1.5 here. This equation becomes negative 15 equals negative 3 plus k1 cosine of k2. We move this over to the side, and we end with this equation here, negative 12, is k1 cosine of k2. Together with the first equation, we have 2. Divide them, k1 cancels out, and we have the tangent of k2, from which rapidly we obtain that k2 is negative 0.1244 radians. We substitute k2 in the first equation and find k1, negative 120934. This is faster, perhaps, right? Just to show you, and there is more than one way of solving these nonlinear problems. After finding a function of time like IL of t, it's always a good idea to plot it. Why? To see if we can detect any anomaly in the curve. In this case, the initial value of the current, 1.5 amps, seems to be right, and the initial slope of that curve is very steep and negative, which is okay. But there is something I don't quite like. I was expecting a sinusoid whose amplitude keeps getting smaller and smaller and smaller. Why don't I see that there? When I look at that curve carefully, we realize that omega is only 1 radians per second. What does it mean? 1 radians per second, the period of that sinusoid is 6.28 seconds. So that sinusoid needs more than 6 seconds to complete one full cycle, one complete oscillation. And at the same time, if the exponential has a time constant of half a second, if we wait 5 time constants, 2.5 seconds, the exponential will have all but killed 
that sinusoid. In 2.5 seconds, the sinusoid has had time only to complete 40% of its cycle. That's why we are not seeing a sinusoid. So it seems that this solution is correct and that is its plot. All of that is fine. But what if we are in an exam, we don't have MATLAB, we don't have Maple, Mathematical, Wolfram, Alpha, and we need to plot one curve like this one. We use the HP50G and you are in my class. Let's see how. Let's plot the current using the HP50G. Click and hold the white shift key and select a 4 2D, 3D. In there, in the second dialog box, we will enter whatever function of time we need to plot. I will use X for time because it's easier to type. I click Edit and we use the equation writer to enter that expression. I have taken the time to pre-type that in advance because I know that all of you know how to do that. Enter and enter out of that. We have provided the calculator with a function of time, actually a function of X, that we want to plot. Next, we click and hold the white shift key and this time we select F2, Windows Operation. In this menu, all I will select is the range on the horizontal axis for which we want the calculator to do the plot between X0 and Enter X2.5 seconds. What about the vertical range? We don't know. But the calculator has this auto function here that allows it to compute what is the minimum value of the curve and the maximum value in the range from 0 to 2.5 so that it selects the range of the vertical axis accordingly. Erase whatever curve is in memory right now and draw the curve. There is our current in the inductor. We can do a few more things. If we select F2, parenthesis X comma Y, then we have the coordinates of the cursor that we can move with the arrow keys. In particular, we could, for instance, ask, what is the minimum value of the current? You see, and we find in there, the minimum value of the current is negative 1.68 amps. And that happens at t equal 0.558 seconds. Or we could ask, at what point in time the current crosses zero? Sure. We just move the cursor to the point where the curve is crossing zero right here and say that curve is crossing zero at uh, 0.115 seconds. Well, that zero is 0 0.02 amps, which is pretty good for a current that begins at 1.5 amps. If we want to find a point with more accuracy, let's say we want to find the zero crossing in more detail. This is what I would do. I would move my cursor so very close to where the crossing is and all the way to the left and then I click on graph on zoom on box Z and then I move my cursor to the right as far as it goes and a little bit above the axis and then I say zoom in check it out I have zoomed in and I see that if I select the x comma y now I have a much better chance of a better accuracy to find what is the zero crossing. The zero crossing happens at 0.124 seconds and the value of the current there is 0 0.001 amps. Much better answer. Now a simple comment for simple series RLC circuits which is our case. It is easier to write the differential equation for the inductor current like this. You see that circuit and you see that current in the inductor which is flowing through all the loop. Of course, we can write a KVL equation in that loop like this. We see that the voltage in the inductor has this polarity and the value is LDIDT. Is LDILDT this term. Plus the drop in this resistor which has that polarity for I and this for I, that is A times I L, and the voltage in the capacitor, that is going to be 1 over C, that multiplies the integral of I L dt. All of that is equal to 0. All of that is fine. All of that is fine, but I don't like integral differential equations, so I differentiate the whole thing, and we land this second order differential equation. Once we're there, we can replace L 
for two Henry's are for eight ohms, four in series with four, and uh, one over C by one over point one, which is ten. And we have now this differential equation. Um, but let me divide all the equation by two, and we land exactly the same differential equation that we had before with the P operator. So you see, it's faster this way. But this works nicely only when we have a series. RLC circuit and we want the current in the inductor or the current in any of the elements. It also works that nicely if we have a parallel RLC and we want the voltage in the capacitor. In any other case, I would use the P operator approach until we see the Laplace transform method and that is still in a couple of weeks. To end this set of slides, let's define what is the damping factor. You see, Sometimes, in cases where a circuit is underdamped, engineers make reference to something they call the damping factor of the circuit. And you will see that in your assignment. The characteristic equation can be written like this. You say, now what is second? There was a coefficient in front of B squared. Well, I divided the whole equation by that coefficient, and it ended being like this, b squared plus mb plus n equals zero. Uh -huh. But automatic control engineers, they prefer to write that equation this way. Why? We shall see that later in the course. But the thing is, when they do that, immediately we say, hey, omega naught squared is n, and 2 times z omega naught is m, right? Well, they have names. Omega naught is called the undamped frequency in radians per second, and it's just the square root of n. And z is the damping factor and is, according to those expressions, m divided by 2 square root of n. However, the true meaning of omega naught and z is more clear if we make reference to the original eigenvalues. Let's say the characteristic equation has two complex conjugate eigenvalues. We can factor out the quadratic equation like that. And then let me distribute the multiplication over those sums, and we get an expression like this one. Please remember that sigma, the real part of those eigenvalues, is a negative number for stable circuits, as we shall see in a month or two. And this term turns out to be a positive one. Well, check this out. If we follow the lead of automatic control engineers and write that characteristic equation this way instead, immediately we realize a couple of things, right? Let me write those two expressions in the next page to find the undamped frequency and the damping factor like here. The eigenvalues again are b1 sigma plus j omega and b2 is sigma minus j omega. Those are the two expressions of before. From then immediately we realize, hey, check this out. Omega naught is the square root of sigma square plus omega square, but that is just the absolute value of the eigenvalue. Which one? Either of them. The undamped frequency is the absolute value of the eigenvalue. What about OZ? Well, the damping factor realize that sigma is Z times omega naught. We better make a drawing, right? And realize that. From those equations, we could say, well, Z is just something. We solve it from there, right? Um, but let me have a look at that graphically. Here is the eigenvalue, one of them. Real part is sigma, which is a negative number, imaginary part omega. The absolute value of the hypotenuse is omega naught, the undamped frequency. And sigma is that undamped frequency times z. So that means that this value times z gives me sigma. G z has to be the cosine of this angle, right? That's correct. So the damping factor is just the cosine of that angle. How is that? Yeah. The damping factor is the cosine of the argument of the eigenvalue of any of them. And that is the last of the topics of this set of slides. With that, I wish you the best of luck in your exams and assignments, 
and thank you very much and I hope to see you again in the next movie. Thank you.